All right, so I think I'm supposed to say that kids, the youth, no, the kids are dismissed, but the youth are staying in this morning. So God bless you guys, the youth are staying in this morning. And that's actually good news because I was reminded last week to remind everybody this week, uh, just like we do at the movies, take your phone and put the little silencer thing on there. And if you're not sure how to do that, the youth can help you. So just raise your hand with your phone and we'll have the youth circulating in the sanctuary. They can help us all figure out. I have to do, I know my phone went off at one point during the live stream. There was nobody I could blame but myself for that. So good to see you guys this week. What a great Easter service we had last week. Uh, it is great to be together again and just so excited to be back in the book of Revelation and just w the things that the Lord has uh, to speak to us and the things that I, I just believe he wants to do in our hearts um, even now this morning. So let's pray and we're going to jump uh, right into the word today. So Father, we thank you so much again just for the opportunity to regather together again in person with your church, Lord, and just to, um, just to be in fellowship, Lord, and to, uh, to love on one another, Lord, uh, in your name. And so we thank you, Lord, for uh, the work that we know that you want to do here this morning in our hearts, and we pray that you would prepare our hearts, Lord. Make us open to those things that your spirit would teach us today. Father, we want to hear from you, and we want you to do that work that only you can do. Lord, help us to be open to that. Uh, Lord, and do give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church this morning. Lord, collectively, corporately, Lord, and of course, individually. We thank you, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Revelation chapter 3, we're going to look at about the first six verses. And as I said, it is so good to be back in the book of Revelation. Always great, of course, to celebrate Easter and take that break for Palm Sunday and for Easter Sunday, uh, but just excited to be back in this revelation of Jesus Christ. We've seen, just to quickly kind of bring us back up to speed, we've seen the Lord Jesus uh, in, in chapter one, remember he instructed his servant John to write some different things, the things which you have seen, that was chapter one, that was the revelation of Jesus himself or the Lord's person. Then he said to write the things which are, right? That's chapters two and three where we are right now. That's the Lord's people where we're, we've seen this entire scope of church history as Jesus addresses his church. And then finally, eventually, we'll get to the things which will take place after this. That's chapters four through 22. It's the things which are yet to come. That's the Lord's program. So the Lord's person, the Lord's people, the Lord's program that's the book of revelation uh, this morning we're going to continue to look in chapter three at these things which are again as the lord jesus the head of the church he speaks directly to his church and remember he speaks to the whole church specifically through these seven specific churches that he selected there out of many of the churches that would have been in asia minor that area of turkey in order to communicate his specific message that he had for the whole church. And we've noted quickly that each of these individual messages has kind of what we've called a fourfold application, that they first of all applied locally. These letters dealt with real people, with real churches that had real problems that really needed to be addressed. But not only did they apply to those churches individually, but of course they apply to all of us, we said ecclesiastically, right, or corporately. They apply to the whole church since the problems that these churches were experiencing are the problems that all churches eventually experience. In addition, we saw that there was kind of a mysterious application to the church historically, in that each one of these seven churches in kind of this arc of different churches seems to, appoint to, seems to point to a portion of church history, right, beginning right at the time of the writing of this letter, reaching right up to our own time, and all of these churches together really kind of paint this comprehensive picture of the history of the church. And finally, of course, most importantly, these letters apply, what, personally. And the words of Jesus are meant for each one of us individually, uniquely as his 
followers. And we've seen in each one of these cases so far, in the first four letters that we've looked at, there's this special word of blessing or of assurance that Jesus speaks to the overcomers that are in each church. And understand, the overcomers in each church aren't necessarily the super saints of each church, but simply they are the true believers in each of these struggling fellowships who are really seeking after the heart of the Lord. And quickly, again, we remember the lessons from each of the four churches. We looked first at the church at Ephesus, often called the Loveless Church. And the, historically, Ephesus represents that church of the apostolic times, the first century. And it wasn't that they were love-less. They had love, but they were lacking the right kind of love. You remember they had left that first love for Jesus. And so he exhorted them to remember and to repent and to return to that first love. Then we looked at the church at Smyrna, right, the persecuted church. And historically, Smyrna represents for us that persecuted church of the second and third centuries. The word Smyrna means bitter. Remember, it's related to that word myrrh, that herb that's this sweet-smelling fragrance that's released only as it's crushed. And we talked about the fact that the faithful testimony of this church amidst their persecution and suffering was like a, a sweet perfume to the Lord. Then we got to the church at Pergamos, right, the compromising church. And historically, we talked about the fact that this was the state church that started to be, get, be joined to Rome. Pergamos, remember, means objectionable marriage because this church was starting to be in kind of a compro compromising relationship with some teachings and some practices that were wrong. And so the Lord encouraged and exhorted them to stay separate from the world. And finally, last time we looked at the church at Thyatira, or the corrupted church. And historically, of course, we talked about the fact that this church represents the dominance of Roman Catholicism, right? The name Thyatira specifically means continual sacrifice. And the whole letter to the church at Thyatira then was just a warning to resist that tendency that we have to cling to or to elevate or to really trust in anything other than the Lord Jesus. So that brings us up to speed and it brings us this morning to the fourth church, right? The next church in our arc of seven churches. And we're going to look at lessons from the church at Sardis. And it starts out in verse 1 of chapter 3. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the wealthy commercial city of Sardis, it was located about 30 miles southeast of our last city of Thyatira. We're just kind of working our way around this circle, and it sat right on one of the most major kind of east-west trade routes. So there was a lot of material, a lot of money that was constantly passing through the city, and as a result, it had become a very prosperous commercial city, a very vibrant kind of an industrial city. Like Thyatira, Sardis was also the center for pagan worship. There was this huge temple to the mother goddess Sibylle. And from the ruins of the temple, they've seen that the columns would have been 60 feet high and more than six feet in diameter. This was a huge structure, right? And this mother goddess was worshipped, as all of these false gods were, through this sexual immorality and these immoral practices. And Sardis, specifically, was a city that was known for kind of its softness and its luxury. It had a, a well-deserved reputation for apathy and immorality because you have this kind of a combination of easy money to be made with this loose moral environment. And I love the way one historian put it. He said that the great characteristic of Sardis was that even on pagan lips, Sardis was a name of contempt. Its people were notoriously loose living, notoriously pleasure and luxury loving. Sardis was a city of decadence. And what's interesting is that at the time, 
of the writing of this letter toward the end, of course, of the first century, despite all of the prosperity of the city and despite all of the activity that would have gone on there within the city, even then, Sardis, historically, was just a shell of its former self. Because 600 years prior to this letter, it was one of the most outstanding and one of the most powerful cities in all of Asia Minor. And now it was a city in deep, deep decline. It was a city that was living kind of upon its former reputation, if you will. It was a city where all of its best achievements were in the past. And what we're going to see, not by coincidence, of course, is that what is true of the city was also very true of the church in that city. And it was in exactly the same characteristics of the church there at Sardis. So it's to this city. Jesus gets right to the point. And what we're going to see is just in the rest of verse 1, he's going to offer both his approval of them, but also his accusation against them. Look what he says at the end of verse 1. He says, I know your works, that you have a name that you are alive but you are dead. Now, of course, this stings a little bit because the only word to this church of Jesus' approval is also the very same word of his accusation. He declares that they have this name, right? They have a reputation for being alive. So apparently they were seen by others as a very effective church, but then he, in the same breath, strips away that reputation of being alive and he declares instead that they really are dead. Now, understandably, the church at Sardis is often described by Bible students as the dead church. And when we hear that, I think what it kind of produces in our mind is a picture, maybe like up on the screen, or a picture of some small fellowship of like aging believers out at the edge of town somewhere and they're just sort of struggling to keep the doors open. They're just kind of trying to live based on the past reputation, the past glory days of that church. And yet, when we see what Jesus says, the picture that Jesus paints here is entirely a different one. And it's far more meaningful, I think, for us today. Jesus says, I know your works. He describes this as being a working church. It's a bustling church. And that word that he uses there for works is that very same word we've seen before. It means labor, work hard, toil to the point of exhaustion. And I think if you were to stop in Sardis and you were to attend the, you know, first church of Sardis or the Sardis community cool church or whatever you want to call it, to go to that church would have been like a study in motion. It would have been a study in busyness. To stop by there on a Sunday morning would have been a study in activity. I mean, just getting there, the signs would have been out in the parking lot and the, the parking attendants would have been attending and the, the greeters would have been greeting and the ushers would have been ushering or ushering or whatever ushers do, right? You'd have these children's ministry workers that were ministering and youth leaders that were leading and you'd have this ministry and that ministry and every ministry you could conceivably think of, they probably had a bulletin that had to be trifold and probably was filled with QR codes because you had to, you know, scan them just to get all the information on all the different ministries because it was just bursting with so many options. And it wasn't just the church members who thought that this was how their church was. The community around them saw that. Jesus says they have a name for being alive. They had this reputation that they were the what's happening church in town and everybody knew it. And yet despite this reputation they had for life and all these apparent signs of life, Jesus saw them for what they really were and he says simply, you are dead. I wonder how Jesus really felt about this church, right? That's clarity, right? That is about as clear and direct as you can possibly get. And Jesus says, you know, you have this re reputation for being alive inside and out. 
And Jesus says, and yet I look at the exact same things that everyone else is looking at. And everyone else is seeing life, he says, but I am telling you that you are dead. D-E-A-D, dead. And so the church of Sardis right here just teaches us first that we need to be very careful not to mistake rigorous, you know, rigorous religious activity for real spiritual life. And of course, Jesus sees through all of that. And as Jesus says here to each church, he says to Sardis, I know your works. Because what a church really is and what a church really does in the spiritual realm is never hidden from Jesus. And if we jump just ahead a little bit, Look what he adds in verse 2. He says, I've not found your works perfect before God. And the sense here is that there was something specific about their work that was not perfect in the sense that it fell short of God's standard. Now, historically, many Bible students see that the church of Sardis represents the Protestant church within the church as a whole. And today, many would say that Protestantism has a name that it's alive, but in reality, it's dead. And the name Sardis, interestingly, means renovation, or it means those who are escaping, or it means remnant. And many have said that the problem with the Protestant Reformation is that it didn't reform enough that we could easily say that it wasn't perfect or it wasn't complete in the sight of God. And we look today and we see that many Protestant denominations continue to utilize a number of the pagan customs that were adopted by the churches at Pergamos and by the church at Thyatira. Practices that we don't find in the Bible like infant baptism and the use of all these pagan symbols and icons and the celebration of all of these different days that the Lord never asked us to celebrate. And I think that there's a, a quick word here for us personally is that we can allow the Lord to make reformations in our own lives, but they just don't go far enough. We don't allow the Lord to have access to take us where he wants to take us. And so what happens is that we look like Christians that are living some sort of a renovated life on the outside, and yet on the inside, we're spiritually dead. Or we're spiritually dry, just like those dry bones we remember that Ezekiel saw in chapter 37 of his prophecy. Because we need that breath of God that's given to us by the Spirit of God. And I think that that is precisely here that we see the real lesson and the real warning of the church at Sardis. Because what really made their works incomplete and what really caused the spiritual death of this church was that they were no longer operating, they were no longer empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that, I think, amplified in just the next verse. They had become disconnected from the head of the church, right? And the life had been cut off, therefore, from the church. You've heard that expression, I'm sure, that someone is running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Well, that is true. And I know this to be true because many years ago, my ill-behaved childhood dog actually bit the head off of a chicken that was running around at one of my friend's houses. And I'm telling you, we watched in horror as this thing ran around the yard for what seemed like five full minutes, right? Frantically running around with all this activity and blood pouring out of this headless neck until finally the poor thing collapsed on the ground and we stared at it to think, okay, is it really done? Is it dead? None of us wanted to get near it, including the dog. And I'm sorry to be so graphic here on a Sunday morning, and yet what's so important for us to understand from a spiritual perspective within any local church is that sometimes so much of the activity that we see might just be evidence that the church has become disconnected from the head. 
Because what happens is that instead of recognizing the disconnect, instead of realizing that we've lost touch with Jesus and that we're no longer receiving his power and we're no longer receiving his direction, churches so often have the talent and they have the skill and they have the ability and the programs, the resources to infuse those things into the life of the church that give the illusion of spiritual life. And yet Jesus looks and he says, hey, in terms of anything eternal happening here at that church, he says that stopped a long time ago because the church is no longer connected to the head. It's no longer connected to that spiritual supply of spiritual power. Now, don't get me wrong. Please don't mishear me. Not every bustling church is a dead church. But any church that has moved away from a real dependence upon the spirit, that is a dead church. And they're a dead church whether they realize it or not. The church at Sardis, I believe, was probably filled with people who sincerely thought that they were alive. And that in and of itself, I think, is a sobering thought. We have an entire church that can potentially be so completely self-deceived about their own spirituality or about their own spiritual effectiveness in the world and the true impact that they're having for the Lord on the world. And so to me, the letter to the church at Sardis is one of the most sobering of the letters. Because we can get to a place where we can fool others so completely, we can even fool ourselves over time as we are fooling others. Just to think that because we have all these other things going on, whether it's in a church or in our own lives, we can think that there's something of the spirit that's happening here. And that's a scary place to be, certainly for a church, but as well for an individual. But moving on, of course, we're going to see that Jesus has the remedy for this issue. And he gives it to us in the next couple verses. Now we see in verses 2 and 3, we see his admonition to them. In verse 2, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, though that last part sounds a little bit scary, this whole thing is actually pretty encouraging because I think what it tells us is that the spiritual condition in the church at Sardis, it was indeed very bad, but it wasn't hopeless. Specifically, look, there, there were things which did remain, Jesus said, which could be strengthened. Jesus hasn't given up on this church or these people. It was late, but it wasn't too late. But the first thing they had to do, what he says, to be watchful. They needed to wake up to their true spiritual condition because they had fallen asleep and because they had become so weak. And I think if you have a pen, right, or if you highlight things in your fancy, there's two words here in verse 3 which I think are key to this prescription that Jesus gives to their problem. Both of these words are circleable. One is even a little more circle. Is circleable a word? One of them is more circleable than the other. And the two words I think that are important in verse 3 are the words remember and the word how. He says, remember therefore how you have received and heard. He calls on them first to remember. Remember back to a time in the history of this church when things were different. Remember back when there was a real spiritual life happening within that church. And then to remember also how it was that that happened. And the word how, I think, is the one you really want to circle. Because notice this, Jesus does not call on them to remember what they had received and what they had heard. The problem here in Sardis is not doctrinal. It's not doctrinal like it was either in Pergamos or in Thyatira, where there was compromise with the word or the, these doctrines of the world that were creeping into the teachings of the church. That is not the problem in Sardis at all. They're not in a bad condition because they've forgotten what they received and heard. They're in a dead condition 
because they had forgotten how they received and how they heard. So how is it that they first received and how is it that they first heard? Well, no doubt it was with an absolute sense of complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And here I believe is Jesus coming to them and he's reminding them of that fact as well as his ability to help them to correct this. Because look back at verse 1 of our text. And as we've noted in each one of the previous letters, Jesus introduces himself to each, each church with what? With a specific characteristic that he takes directly from John's description of him in chapter 1. And in each case, Jesus uses that to strategically remind them of something that either the church has forgotten about him or of something that they need to be doubly sensitive to and doubly conscious of. And in this case, the prescription here for the problem of the church at Sardis, the prescription for the problem of lifelessness in the church, you know, in the lives of the people, his prescription is found in the description of him in verse 1. Look at it as he who has what? The seven spirits of God. And we remember just in, like we saw in chapter one, the seven spirits of God is a clear reference to that sevenfold or that complete ministry of the Holy Spirit. Remember we said early on, there are 404 verses in Revelation and fully 278 of them are references directly to the Old Testament so that we could learn from the Old Testament and try to understand what it is that Jesus is saying to us and what it is that he's really revealing to us about himself. And in this case, it comes from Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 11, verse 2, which is a description of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which would be upon the coming Messiah. It says that the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And these things are the very things which are crucial in the work of the church and, of course, in the life of any one of us as believers. So the church at Sardis is the church that had lost sight of this ministry of the Spirit. And they're dead because they've moved from a dependence upon the Holy Spirit, they're no longer under the control of the Spirit, and they have been cut off from what it is that he and he alone can bring to a local church. And not only what he and he alone can bring to the local church, but what he and he alone can bring to a human life. Nothing less than what it says there in Isaiah 11, the Spirit of the Lord that wisdom and that understanding and that counsel and that knowledge that he alone can supernaturally give to us so that we understand how to navigate all of the difficult decisions and the situations and the circumstances that come to us in life as well as as we try to minister to God's people. It's that supernatural insight into what's really happening in the spiritual realm it's that insight into the heart of God that only God can provide. And that's what's supposed to direct each and every decision that we make. And in addition to all of that, there's the power, or it says there the might that he provides. It's that power that he provides so that we can do the work that he's called us to do, so that we can live the lives that he's called us to live. It's that sense of reverence for him or that fear of him. That's what keeps us seeking after him and looking to him for approval, not looking for the approval of people so that we make sure that we're putting his desires above all else. So that we can make sure that we're all ministering as a church in a way that glorifies him and him alone. And so when we put ourselves in the place of the church at Sardis, where they've moved away from this sense of dependence and instead they've turned to the cleverness of man or the methods of man or the programs of man and the wisdom of man and we ask who in the right mind would want to go to that church that church that may have all that going on and yet it's cut off from the ministry 
of the Holy Spirit. We are not a perfect church. Of course, you know that, and yet you're still here. God bless you. But our heart here at Calvary Mountain View is to do what the Lord would have us to do and to do only what the Lord is actually directing us to do. We could absolutely have a very bursting bulletin and hundreds of different ministries. And to be perfectly honest, that is much more so my propensity. I inherently lean in that direction of over-programming and over-scheduling. And yet the word that Jesus speaks to the church at Sardis is a word for every one of us, whether we're in church leadership or not. It's that reminder that it's only the Holy Spirit that can breathe life into a church collectively and breathe life into each one of us individually. Plans, programs, methods, all of those things ultimately lead only one place, according to Jesus, and that's where? Death. If it's not of the Spirit, it leads to death. And only the Holy Spirit can breathe true spiritual life, not just into a church, but into every believer whose life is lifeless. Probably all of us at one point in our walk have experienced that, that frustration when our own efforts and all the resolutions that we're making and all the plans that we make, all they lead to is frustration and defeat because they're imperfect, right? They're incomplete before him because Jesus promised us, remember back in Acts chapter one so long ago, he said, you shall receive power when? when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And he says, as a result of that, you shall be witnesses to me. And remember that Jesus is the only one who has the fullness of the Spirit in himself, so he's the only one that can give that fullness to the church. Remember how it was when we first received? Right? Whether it's in the life of a church or in, in our lives individually, there is something that is so special about those first days or months or maybe even years when everything in the Lord was so fresh. Remember back to that time when we depended on the Lord for everything because we didn't know anything. Right? There was this real sort of sense of help me Jesus every day because, you know, that attitude of kind of desperation, but that's precisely the attitude that Jesus wants us to have again. And so much so that in that same verse, there's this precious promise that he is going to come and shake us up to wake us up. He says in verse three, therefore, if you will not watch what I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know the hour when I will come upon you. And prophetically, some see in this, this warning from Jesus to the dying Protestant church, the warning of his coming at the rapture, a reminder to us of this biblical reality that those who are not watching are going to be taken by surprise, or I should say, not taken by surprise. Matthew 24, he says, watch therefore, for you do not know the hour that your Lord is coming. First Thessalonians 5, he says, Paul says, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as what? As a thief in the night. And it's an unfortunate fact that a part of the professing church will be left behind at the rapture of the church. And yet for now, for us here and now, for each of us personally, I think there is this promise that Jesus will do what he needs to do to wake us from our slumber. That he'll come and he will chasten and he will chastise, not to punish us, but to bring us back into that place of dependence and reliance upon him. Don't ever take Jesus' delay in judging your sin as him somehow accepting your sin or accepting our apathy. He assures us that he will come to shake us up, and when he does, it's going to catch us unaware if we're not watching for it. Now, the interesting thing about Sardis is that this warning specifically would have really struck a memory chord in their minds. 
related to their own history. Because remember we said that the, the city of Sardis at this point was kind of a shadow of its former glory. Well, that was because on two different occasions in their history, an enemy had come upon them quickly and conquered the city completely because the citizens of Sardis were overconfident in their security. The ancient city of Sardis, you can kind of see it in the picture, but the ancient part of the city was built up upon this high plateau that was kind of at the end of a ridge that came off of a mountain. And so it was absolutely easy to defend. It was nearly impossible to conquer. You had to go up these sheer cliffs to get to it. And yet 400 years before this letter was written, King Cyrus of Persia was the first who was able to conquer it. And it's a great story, but a, a small detachment of his soldiers were kind of staking out the city. And what they saw is they saw one of two of the guards of Sardis drop his helmet over the edge of the city wall, and it kind of tumbled down into the valley floor below. And then the soldier used a little hidden path to leave the city to go down into the valley to retrieve it, of course, completely unaware that he was being watched. And so that night, these same soldiers of Cyrus snuck into the city using that secret path and that secret door. And when they got into the city, they found the city completely unguarded at night. And they conquered it in an, in an evening because the city had lost their watchfulness. And so Jesus says, you need to wake up and you need to start watching related to these things, lest the, the danger of your self-reliance and the danger of your overconfidence, spiritually speaking, lest that causes you to be taken by surprise. And maybe there's a word there for some of us this morning. Sir Winston Churchill apparently said to Britain, in the early days of World War II, he said, I must drop one word of caution. For next to cowardice and treachery, overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness, this is the worst of wartime crimes. And I think that sometimes we can get so comfortable and so confident and just so kind of complacent in our faith that we fail to be watchful and we're not on guard against those constant attacks that come from our enemy. And yet see next, for those of us who are aware, right? for those in Sardis who did keep his coming in their minds and who were watchful and who did remember, Jesus has these next words of assurance for them. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before the angels. So while we see that as a whole, this church was dying Jesus still recognized that there was a small godly remnant in the church of Sardis who hadn't yet kind of soiled their clothes with this sin. Now raise your hand if you think you're one of the few, uh, no don't, don't do, don't raise your hand. I hope that we're all some of the few. But notice, do notice this, in verse 4, notice that Jesus is clear that there are only a few names in Sardis. Remember in Pergamos and in Thyatira, Jesus said that there were a few bad amongst the good, but here in Sardis, there are only a few good amongst the bad. And I think that there's a very specific reason for that, because here's this church with this tremendous appearance of life, but they had no holiness. There was no sense of holiness running wide scale throughout the body. And I know this to be true because whenever you remove the emphasis on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, you remove, first of all, the desire, but you also remove the ability 
for God's people to live holy lives. Because the Holy Spirit is the one and the only one who gives us that desire and who imparts to us the power to do those things that the Lord would have us to do. And so what happens in a Sardis church is that the teaching of the word of God, the bar tends to be set so low because the leadership is afraid to ask or set too high of a standard because they know that the people will never live up to it. Now, not that any of us can live up to it on our own strength, and yet it's the confidence that we have in the Holy Spirit to take us to all of these lofty places that we see him describe in the scriptures. Right? But if we don't have the confidence that he can do that for us, then what happens is all those sermons tend not to raise the bar at all spiritually, and instead, all that the sermons do in a Sardis church is comfort people in their carnality. And if that doesn't happen, here's the second thing that happens, is that the preaching sometimes can continue to set this high standard, just like it's laid out in the scriptures, but without an emphasis on the Holy Spirit and his work, then the people have no ability to live up to the standard. So what you're doing is you're forcing people to be actors. Right? You're forcing them to become hypocrites so that they give the appearance of being holy and the appearance of life when they're in meetings together with other Christians. But any time that they're away from these specific environments, like Jesus says here, they're defiled and they're dead, they're, they're living lives that are something altogether different because we can't live this Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. But with him, we can overcome. We can walk, as Jesus says, holy and undefiled. We can be clothed in white garments, right? Speaking of this intimate, unbroken fellowship that we can have with Jesus. It's this picture of that kind of a close fellowship and friendship. Remember in Genesis chapter 5, where it talks about Enoch, and it says that Enoch walked with God, right? And this intimacy is the greatest reward that Jesus can possibly give to us as his followers. So to these Christians in Sardis, right, the ones who are the overcomers, the ones who recognize that they're in this condition and realize that they're separated from the Spirit, that they're falling asleep, right, remember the importance and the dependence upon him and return to it, they will be rewarded with a closer, more intimate fellowship with him. And this reward ultimately is far better motivator than any fear of being punished or ruined by our sin. You see, the pure have a greater intimacy with the Lord, not because they have earned it, but simply because they're seeking after it through their dependence and through their obedience. Have you ever noticed that in your own life? God promises that he will reward us as we seek him. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that blessed are the pure in heart for what? They shall see God. And this is so key because the difference between that dead majority who have the imperfect works but this great reputation and those very few names that were pleasing to God, the difference is purity. Because our intimacy with Jesus is always related to our purity. And that's the first promise that Jesus is making here. The second promise that Jesus gives to the overcomer is what really scares people half to death, right? It's where he says that they will, he will what? Not blot his name out from the book of life. Now, verse 5 has bothered people because it seems to suggest that an unfaithful Christian will have their name taken out of the book of life. And yet the teaching of the body of the scripture is that if there's a person who is truly born again by the Holy Spirit, that that person remains regenerated. That person stays saved. Right? Jesus said in John 10 that I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So, while this passage here in verse 5, it may imply 
that a name could be erased from the book of life, when we stop and consider it in the context of the text, it actually is only affirming that their name will not be erased. See, the context is here is one of assurance. It's not the idea that Jesus is somehow sitting up in heaven with a busy eraser. And yet, with, with that said, I need to say this. When someone comes to me brokenhearted about the sin in their life, brokenhearted about their inability to live the kind of a life that they want to live, I take him to John 10. Right? Like we just saw where Jesus says that that person is eternally secure in him. Or I take them to Romans 8, right, 38 and 39, where, where it says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Take them to 2 Timothy, where we're reminded that God is able to keep that which is committed to him. But then when you have the person that comes and says, look, I don't care what you think. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do this my way. This is none of your business. Well, we take that person to a different set of scriptures. You can look them up later, but we take them to 1 Corinthians 6 and to Galatians 5 and to Ephesians 5. We take them here to Revelation 3, 5. Because the fact is that a person who's living a life with no signs of repentance, month after month after year after year after decade after decade, that person's salvation is not on very solid ground. I don't want to give that person a false sense of assurance. We're not saved by what we do, but what we do will be an evidence that we've really been saved. And it's only as we are abiding in Jesus that we can be sure of our salvation. Verse 6, right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I think this letter to the church at Sardis, it's a searching letter for any local church. First of all, about the place of the Holy Spirit within that church. The need for that full, sevenfold working, uh, his ministry, right? The wisdom, understanding, and counsel, and knowledge, and the power that he provides to do the ministry the way that he wants it to be done. Right? The Holy Spirit is the fire that fuels the church and the very same fire that fuels each of our lives as believers. And we so desperately need his filling and we need his direction and we need his power. And yet like this church, corporately, right, we lose our connection with the Spirit in our lives because of our complacence or because of compromise. And then we immediately lose that power. And we lose that passion. And I think at its root, I, one of the reasons I love this letter to the church at Sardis is because I think it's such a clear and an important call to us just to cease from all of our self-sufficiency. Because ultimately that only leads to death. And just to return to that complete reliance upon the Spirit because that's what's going to infuse life into our lives not just of our churches or our ministries, but first and foremost, into our own hearts. It is still true what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul when he said that my grace is sufficient for you. And what did he say? He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. To which Paul said that, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And that sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? And yet it's a spiritual reality. That it's only when we try, when we finally stop trying to kind of grind out this Christian life on our own, it's only when we simply let Jesus live in us through the Spirit, only then do we start to enjoy that victory as overcomers. And so as we close this morning, maybe there are some of you who've been in a place lately where you do feel like you've been drifting, kind of in like a sleepy apathy toward, you know, heading toward that spiritual dryness or that spiritual death. But what I want you to know this morning, if that's you, is that there is always hope, right? There's hope for a dead church and there's hope for a dead believer because Jesus 
is an expert at raising the dead. And maybe you look this morning at your life and you recognize that the Spirit seems to be missing or that he's absent, right? The, the, over time, sometimes we can look at the things that we're doing in our lives and the things that we're doing in our homes or the things that we're doing in our businesses, all the different areas of our life, and we realize suddenly that there is nothing supernatural related to any of those things anymore. And it's good for us to ask, right? I'll ask myself, and maybe you guys would join me. It's good to ask ourselves, when was the last time that we asked to be freshly filled by the Holy Spirit? When was the last time that I was really walking in the supernatural and that I was open to his ministry and experiencing his leading and his gifting and his working in my life? And when was the last time that was all flowing out of my life the way that it used to? And sometimes it can be days or weeks or maybe it's even been months between those times that we've asked to be freshly filled. When was the last time that you started your day by surrendering to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Just saying, Lord, I give you my life today for you to use according to your purpose. Right? I give you my eyes and my ears and my mind and my heart and my hands and my feet. I give you all of me and all I ask, Lord, is that you would do something that makes an impact spiritually and eternally and do that through me today. And Lord, I'm giving you all of me today toward that purpose. And it's so very easy in the Christian life for any of us to get to that point where we say, wow, you know what? It has been years since I've done that. And we may have individually, we may have personally, probably unknowingly, we may have become a part of the church at Sardis. And yet this morning, right, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm here, and I have what you need. I have the seven spirits of God. I have the full seven-fold ministry of my Holy Spirit and everything that it entails, and I want to give that to you, he says, afresh and anew this morning, if you will simply ask me for it. So I'm going to invite... Kirsten and the team to come up. Uh, and as we minister in this last song, let's just take this time as an opportunity. If you haven't asked that recently of the Lord, ask him for that this morning. Ask him to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. Keep asking him. Why? Because we leak, all of us, don't we? We get filled up and it all leaks out and we ask again. If you need prayer for that, I'm sure we can do it in some safe, socially distant way. But maybe um, some of the pastors would come up and Michelle, if some of the ladies wanted to come up and just be here available. If anyone wants prayer, come forward. You don't need to come forward. You can pray right where you are. But let's just use this as a time to kind of do some business with the Lord and just to confess once again, Lord, I need you. I need to get back on track and I need your power. I need the ministry of your spirit in my life to do it, to breathe fresh life kind of into these dry bones. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and how we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for um, just the encouragement that it gives to us. Um, Father, the way that you lay this out so clearly, Lord, in the lives of these people, uh, Lord, these real people in this real city, uh, of Sardis, Lord, and yet how it speaks in such a real way to each of our lives this morning. So, Father, I do pray that if there are those this morning who are feeling dry and who are feeling weary, Lord, and who realize that they've disconnected themselves from you, Lord, maybe they are running around like that chicken, Lord, and we don't want to do that anymore. So, Father, whether they come forward and ask for prayer, Lord, or whether they just come to you in the privacy of their own hearts this morning. Lord, for those of you at home, you can pray along with us today. Lord, we want to ask for a fresh filling of your spirit and of his ministry in our lives. And we ask these things, Lord, in the mighty and the 
matchless name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Let's worship.